So uh, thanks very much for inviting me to talk today about TLR8, and I'll give you a, a brief overview in the 10 minutes we have of uh, the work that we've done with 9688, which is a TLR8 agonist. I think first, just to step back and sort of um, appreciate potential roles that TLR8 agonists may have in chronic HBV. Um, a variety of immune cells within the liver express TLR8, these uh, dendritic, conventional dendritic cells, MDCs or CDCs as they're called now, CUFA cells, monocytes. There's also Tregs as well, and uh, as well as some um, granulocytic uh, myeloid derived suppressor cells and the, and the myeloid version of those as well. So um, the overall hypothesis is that we could activate these intrahepatic immune cells um, as well as in inhibiting some of these immunosuppressive cells within the liver environment and collectively um, to uh, reinvigorate the immune response in the liver, both CD8, B cells as well as potentially some of these innate populations that Adam just described. So last year, I sort of gave an introduction um, to TLR8 or 9688 itself. It's a selective agonist of, of human TLR8. Um, and uh, we presented a variety of data which has been shown at both ESL and ASLD on its uh, immunomodulatory functions in human PBMCs. It activates the CDCs, uh, both CDC1 and CDC2, enhances HPV-specific CD8 T cell function, um, reducing PD1 and enhancing interferon gamma levels and also activates uh, NK cells and mate cells as you would expect from inducer of IL-12 and IL-18. The cytokines that these cells produce uh, also have an antiviral effect on HPV infected primary human hepatocytes, reducing DNA, RNA and also the antigen levels within them. And 9688 is also efficacious in the woodchuck model of, of chronic HPV, although we see about 40% approximately of animals are antiviral responders and I'll come back to that uh, in some coming slides. So just to give you a quick update of where we stand in the development uh, of 9688, um, we have completed a couple of different studies, a phase 1A healthy volunteer study completed. This was sequential cohorts dose escalation from 0.5 to 5 megs. This is orally single dose. We saw a dose dependent increase in a lot of the um, biomarkers you'd expect in the, in the periphery, IL-12, P40, interferon gamma, as well as a number of different chemokines which we expected to um, recruit T cells, NK cells, and uh, myeloid derived cells into the liver itself. Nausea was the main AE that we saw, uh, and then also transient uh, elevations in ALT at the highest dose level, the 5 mix. We then moved to HPV patients, both on and off oral antiviral treatment, OAV treatment. Uh, we used the, the, the intermediate doses, the 1.5 mg and the 3 mg, and this was a, a short study once a week for, for two to four doses. Again, we saw the same PD responses. We didn't see any evidence of, of reduction in the PD response in HPV patients, and we saw no evidence of tachyphylaxis, i.e. the diminution of the response after multiple doses. Again, um, we got uh, the, the compound was generally well tolerated with no discontinuations, and again, headache and nausea were the main AEs. Um, in this short study, we didn't see any ch significant changes in S antigen or viral endpoints. So currently, we're in the phase two studies here, um, again, on patients on and off oral antiviral treatment, again, the 1.5 and 3 mg doses once a week for 24 weeks. Uh, we've just recently completed the OAV-treated patient study, and that data will be presented at ASLD. And the OAV-untreated study, the naive patients concomitantly treated with nukes, uh, is still ongoing. So I wanted to also give an update on some of the additional characterization that we've done preclinically of the compound. Um, first, just uh, although I won't, don't have time to show the data, um, Marla Maney's group uh, have generated some, some very nice data that was presented at EASL related to the inhibition of these immunosuppressive cells in the liver that I was talking about, although this has been done with uh, PBMCs at this stage. Um, the compound, as has been, um, would be expected from some of the previous data, reduces both CD40 reg uh, uh, frequency and also uh, in, reduces GMDSC uh, um, by driving their maturation uh, over a period of several days. I think I also wanted to draw your attention to um, an interesting paper that also came out in Nature Immunology last year showing that TLR8 agonists can promote uh, TFH, these T follicular helper cells that uh, Marla briefly mentioned earlier by differentiating them via IL-12, and these play a key role in the development of, of B cell responses, um, at least in germinal centers. So additional characterization that we've done um, has focused uh, primarily on the woodchuck model, and um, 
we've, we've done an extensive amount of work here to really understand the translational relevance of this model. Um, it's the only um, fully immunocompetent model of natural infection, albeit with a, with a surrogate virus, WHV, not HBV. And here we've compared uh, the levels of cytokines that we've, uh, we can induce in this model at the efficacious dose compared with what we can achieve in humans. And um, obviously this model has, has a lot of advantages. The major disadvantage is extremely difficult to do any immunology in it. Um, essentially most antibodies from mouse and human don't cross-react with woodchuck, so we have to develop our own. So in this case we developed a woodchuck IL-12 P40 ELISA as well as a woodchuck interferon bioassay. And on the right here, you can see um, the data from the three meg efficacious dose in woodchucks with 9688, as well as what we can achieve at three megs in humans um, at the safe and tolerated dose that's uh, going forward in the, in the phase two uh, studies. So pretty similar um, comparable levels of this, this key cytokine. We see very low levels of interferon uh, by bioassay, although we do see some um, in patients uh, using ultrasensitive ELISA, interferon gamma that is. I think if you contrast this with 9620, which is the TLR7 agonist that we previously took into development, um, the human data is um, well known for this compound. Um, it produced ISGs, interferon-stimulated genes, but no frank circulating interferon, and no IL-12, uh, albeit at the clinical doses. If we look into the woodchuck, we've got very strong induction of interferon alpha, um, and also IL-12. Um, so suggesting that we are inducing in TLR7 to a greater extent than we could in humans, I think the IL-12 induction is somewhat interesting. It suggests that perhaps we're also inducing TLR-8 in these, in these animals, and certainly some of our in vitro data would suggest the compound is much less selective for TLR-7 uh, relative to human TLR-7. As I mentioned earlier, we've also been uh, trying to pull apart uh, the responses that we've seen in woodchucks, the responders versus non-responder phenotype. And here we just have a, a, a smallish study where we've... Um, We've uh, treated the animals with three megs per kg, 9688, for, for uh, 12 weeks, and then looked and tried to compare the responders to non-responders. Again, the responders here in green, the non-responders in red. And on the, on the top right, you can see the plasma levels of 9688. Uh, essentially, there's no difference between the responders and non-responders. And if we look at serum IL-12, the same uh, phenotype is true. We don't really see any differentiation between the animals that respond and the animals that don't. Um, Adam nicely introduced sort of the advantages of uh, looking in the liver. And so we had baseline pretreatment biopsies from these animals. And so we went and did RNA-seq on those. So here um, is the data from that. The top plot here is a module analysis of what we've detected here using sort of uh, reference gene signatures to identify different cell populations. And also we, we also compared this to some uninfected animals as well to help um, understand the differentiation that we're seeing here. So essentially there are some differences. It's somewhat heterogeneous. These are a single biopsy from a small number of animals. But what we tended to see was a, a higher incidence or a higher enrichment of, of macrophages, particularly M1 macrophages, but most also particularly I think plasma cells and Tregs, perhaps paradoxically, were enriched in the animals that went on to respond. As we then look on an individual level, I think um, the signature that really struck us the most was the fact that uh, uh, intrahepatic IL-21 levels were um, higher in the animals that went on to respond versus the animals that didn't respond. And consistent with this Treg cell signature, we also see higher levels of FOXP3 in these animals. So I've attempted to try to sort of collate all of this uh, data, and, as well as a lot of data that I didn't have time to show you today, into a sort of model of how we think 9688 may be working in, in vivo. And essentially, this boils down to the fact that we can activate these CDCs. Um, these CDCs are expected to produce IL-12, and IL-12 has got some, um, obviously, uh, promising properties in terms of activating CD8 T-cell responses, and Marler's lab have done some nice work showing a reinvigoration of exhausted T-cells in that regard. And as, I, as I mentioned earlier, also, IL-12 has been recently shown to also drive differentiation of these TFH cells. Um, the TFH cells themselves are likely the source of the intrahepatic IL-21 IL uh, that we saw, we believe. And this obviously has then clear trebling effects both on CD8 T-cells but also on B-cells. Um, as I mentioned, Tregs have also been uh, reported to express TLR8, and so uh, together with Marla's um, data, as well as some data we have in some other animal models, we believe that 9688 has the potential to reduce the level of intrahepatic uh, Tregs, either directly or through uh, immunoregulatory cytokines, such as IL-6 and TNF. 
And I think this sort of brings kind of full circle a lot of the studies that have been done most recently um, in preclinical settings, but also in the clinic. Um, TFH have been reported to play a very key role in uh, generation of an effective immune response in an adoptive transfer model in the mouse. Um, in both Jody Barron's lab and a number of other animal models. Um, we saw the same type of signature um, as well in chimpanzees that were treated with a high dose of 9620. And I think IL-21 and the such, CXCL-13, et cetera, have also been shown to have some uh, uh, correlation with antiviral response um, in HBV patients as well. I think in particular, the, 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 the models from the adoptive transfer and from the chimpanzee have suggested that there's formation of these intrahepatic aggregates of lymphoid cells within the liver are important, I'm about to finish, in, um, in developing this intrahepatic uh, priming uh, as such. And so I think it's interesting that CUFA cells, which are essential, we believe, for probably this type of function, particularly in the mouse model, also express TLR8 and have produced CXCL13 in response to 9688, which is a key organizing chemokine for these, uh, for these lymphoid follicle type structures. So uh, a brief summary, um, updated you on the preclinical and clinical development of 9688. Uh, I think we're making strides in the preclinical setting in terms of trying to understand mechanistically how this, uh, this uh, innate immune uh, agonist can also affect a variety of different immune cells within the liver. And I think the, 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 f the focus on the liver TFH and the treatment response in the woodchucks uh, uh, is probably worth following up. Clinical stages, uh, we've completed phase one, and uh, we've shown that there's a comparable PD response at the efficacious dose in the woodchuck model is what we're able to achieve safely in humans. And additional data from uh, the phase two studies will be disclosed at ASLD. Thanks for your attention.